So the first thing we're going to do is go over kind of a crash course on the anatomy of our upper extremities, and you'll hear me um, kind of interchangeably use the words arm and upper extremity. When I say upper extremity, I'm just referring to from like your shoulder blade to your fingertips, your arms. Um, we'll go over physical presentations, whether that be after a stroke or after a spinal cord injury or after a brain injury. Um, we'll talk about common injuries that can happen to your arm after um, these brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. I'll kind of talk you through um, how a therapist is thinking and how to think like a therapist when assessing an arm and all the things that we're thinking of when we look at our patients. Um, we'll talk about um, principles of neuroplasticity, and that probably sounds like a lot of big words that mean nothing to you, but I promise I'll explain them in more detail. Um, and then lastly, we'll go over how to protect, engage with, and improve um, your arms. And I'm going to be referring to upper extremities and arms as your, your neurologic arm or your neurologic shoulder or a neurologic hand. And that just means someone who's had a stroke or a brain injury or a spinal cord injury and still has their arms in their hands. It's now a neurologic limb. So those are some vocabulary words we're going to be using today. So to start us off, we're just going to kind of start um, top down. So your arm, what is it made up of? We have our shoulder blade or our scapula in the back, um, and then we have our clavicle or our collarbone in the front. Those two bones come together at your shoulder to make um, your shoulder joint. Then you got this big um, bone right here in your arm. It's called your humerus. So all those things up here, your shoulder blade and your clavicle form a socket, and then your humerus has a head to it that's going to form a ball. So your shoulder is a ball and socket joint, meaning we can rotate our arms in a lot of different directions, and it's made up primarily of those three bones, but lots of other muscles and tendons also make that capsule of your shoulder joint. Moving down the arm, once we get past the shoulder, then we have the humerus on your arm. We get to our elbow um, and our forearm. Your forearm is made up of two bones, your ulna and your radius. As you can see in the pictures provided, they kind of, we, we can turn our wrist up and down like this. Those two bones are going to cross over each other um, as you turn your wrist. And then moving a little bit further down, we have our wrist and our hands. This picture is very detailed. I don't you know, expect you to know how to say all those words or understand what they are. The general thinking is, you know, you got these two bones right here on your forearm. Then you got some tiny bones right here at the base of your palm. You got some longer bones in here called your metacarpals in your palm. And then you have your fingers or your digits um, that can move also in a lot of different directions. Some more anatomy review, and I know this probably isn't the most exciting part, and I promise I'm trying to get through it as quickly as possible, but it's important for me to kind of get us all on the same knowledge base before I start talking about um, a lot of the recovery um, aspects of our arms. So our brain and our spinal cord and our nerves. So obviously our brain sits in our skull and it connects to our spinal cord, which starts, you know, up in our neck and goes all the way down to our tailbone. Your tailbone is in, or your spinal cord is inside of your spine and our brain and our spinal cord are made up of neurons and nerves that form pathways all through our body that help us move and also help us sense and feel the world around us. So we're taking in information through our spinal cord and our brain with touch and sensation, hot, cold, pain, things like that, just different sensory components. And then we're also putting information out through our motor um, movements, just how we move our bodies. And that all is coming from our brain and our spinal cord. Something important to keep in mind is that your brain is kind of flip-flopped in how it controls your body. So the right side of your brain controls the left side of the movements on your body and then vice versa. This is not the same in the spinal cord. The right side of your spinal cord controls the right side of your body and same thing with the left side. So the brain is flip-flopped, but the spinal cord is not. 
Um, so now we'll talk about some things that can happen to your body after a stroke or a spinal cord injury, one of them being um, hemiplegia or hemiparesis, hemi meaning half, so half of your body. Not everybody who has a stroke is going to experience hemiplegia or hemiparesis. It all depends on where the stroke happens in our brain because our brains are helping us do not only our motor function, but also helping us think and talk and um, read and do lots of different things. So if you have a stroke um, that affects your motor function and your body, it means it happened in a specific area of your brain where um, your brain is controlling that motor function. So not everybody who has a stroke has hemiparesis or hemiplegia, but it is, is common. So hemiplegia, hemiparesis is weakness on one half of the body. If you have an injury on the right side of your brain, you can likely have weakness or paralysis on the left side of your body and vice versa. Doesn't have to be a stroke. This can also um, happen after a traumatic brain injury. If you hit your head after a fall or um, a motor vehicle accident, anything that can damage the brain um, doesn't have to be an acquired injury like a stroke. Um, and then kind of moving from the brain to the spinal cord, spinal cord injuries are associated with paraplegia and quadriplegia. Para meaning half of your body, not in the sense like right and left, but top and bottom. Para meaning your bottom half of your body and quadriplegia meaning your whole body. So our spinal cord has different nerves that come um, out of different levels of our spine. So the higher up your injury on your spinal cord, the more of your body that's going to be involved um, or injured in the process. So if I have a spinal cord injury and it happens up high around my neck, then most likely my arms or my hands are going to be involved in the injury. If it's lower, then you, you're getting more nerves and more motor function up top. Um, meaning that your legs might just be involved or even as low as just your knees or your quads um, or your feet. So now we're going to kind of move into, so lots of information being thrown at you. Um, we can ask questions at the end, of course, but we're going to kind of switch gears here. Um, that was kind of a crash course on uh, anatomy and um, how our brains and our spinal cords and our arms, all the elements of that. So now we're going to kind of move into what a therapist is thinking when we come in and we start working with you and your arms after one of these types of injuries. So the first thing we're going to assess is your range of motion. And we're going to ask you, can you lift your shoulder up to here? Can you move your elbow? Can you wiggle your fingers? If you can't do any of that, meaning you're so weak that you don't have that active range of motion, then we move on to something called active assistive range of motion. And that is, okay, well, you can't move your by yourself, um, but if I give you a little boost to your elbow, um, can you then uh, move your shoulder? Or if I give you a boost at your lower arm, can you then move your elbow? Um, and that is called active assisted range of motion. If you can't do that, the injury that um, happened to either your brain or spinal cord has taken away all of that muscle tone or muscle movement, then we would move on to passive range of motion. And passive range of motion is really important for joint integrity and protecting our joints of our upper extremity. So um, I would take your arm and move it completely by myself. Can I take it up to 90 degrees of shoulder flexion or can I lift your arm up in front of you before your tendons or your bones or your muscles stop me? Um, so that passive is really looking at um, kind of how stretchy or how bendy you still are. Um, the next thing after range of motion is assessed is your strength. So if you did have that active range of motion, we'll see just how strong you are. And we grade strength on a scale of zero to five. Zero meaning you have nothing, five meaning you could push a car, you know, very strong. Some other things that we're um, looking at are your coordination. So your fine motor coordination or how your fingers all work together to 
open a tube of toothpaste or be able to manipulate a fork in your hand to eat your food. Um, and then also gross motor coordination, how your whole arm is working together. So can I reach for that cup in the cabinet or can I hold on to my walker and push it along with my shoulder and my elbow and my hands all being used together? Um, another thing we will look at is your speed and how quickly you can move your hands. Um, after a stroke, some people can have something called bradykinesia, which makes your movements just very slow. And these are all things that we can work on with practice, right? If you've got some slow movements, then we can just work on speed and therapy. Um, another thing we look at is calibration. Do I know how much force to apply with my arm? So maybe I have the strength and I have the range of motion, but I don't have the coordination or the calibration to know how much force to apply to push open a door or how hard to squeeze my fork when trying to feed myself. Um, we'll also look at sensation. So can you close your eyes and can you feel me touching your fingers or do you know where I'm touching you on your arm? And this poses a big safety concern. If you don't have sensation in your arm, then you're not going to know if it's touching something hot or if it's fallen out of your wheelchair and it's getting caught in your wheelchair spokes and you're getting bruised up. It's um, dangerous when you don't have that sensation. So we like to teach a lot of strategies. Um, when people are missing their sensation. And then one of the last things we'll look at is tone or spasticity. So people after these injuries can be hypertonic, meaning too much tone, too, um, it makes your muscles very tight and kind of contracted, or hypotonic, meaning you're flaccid, you have no um, muscle tone. Um, and they both present... Um, differently and we'll we'll treat them differently and we'll we'll talk about some of the treatments that we would do for either of those things but those are some of the elements that me as a therapist I would look at coming into your room to assess your arm whether you had your stroke two weeks ago or you had your stroke two years ago or spinal cord injury whatever it may be um, so now we're going to talk about um, some things that can happen to our arms after these injuries one of them and probably the most common being a subluxation. It's a fancy word for dislocation. So our shoulder, that ball and socket joint I was talking to you about earlier, um, it's held together with muscles and tendons. And when we have a spinal cord injury or a stroke or a brain injury, those muscles can weaken and they're not holding that joint in place anymore. So literally your humerus and that ball and socket joint starts to fall out because it doesn't have the strength to hold your body in the correct position. Um, a subluxation by itself is not painful, mainly because subluxations happen over time. Um, you know, the longer you're weak for, the, the more the joint will start to fall out of the, um, the location that it's supposed to be in. Um, but subluxation does put us at risk for injury that can be painful, which is why a lot of people with strokes or spinal cord injuries or brain injuries um, have shoulder pain. Uh, because they just don't have the musculature to keep things where they're supposed to be. So it puts us at risk. So some of those things can be um, something called impingement syndrome. So our ball and socket joint, that shoulder area in the front has a lot of, um, and you can even feel it on yourself. Take your arm, poke around on your shoulder. Don't press too hard. Don't hurt yourself. But you can kind of feel a little space right here in the front and in that space there is um, there are nerves and musculature and vasculature that runs through that space so impingement syndrome is when those things start to get pinched it's exactly what it sounds like they're impinged and that can be painful you can also have it posteriorly or in the back of your shoulder because we have another little space back here that opens up um, and there are tendons and veins and arteries and things that run through there and they can get pinched um, when we have that subluxation. Now something to keep in mind to avoid impingement syndrome is we always want to move our shoulders or our arms in the thumbs up position. 
So um, if you have two um, working arms that are healthy and you don't have any uh, neurological injuries on your shoulders and you don't have any shoulder pain, you can go ahead and try this. If you um, sit with one arm out in front of you with your thumb up and the other one with your thumb down and you try to raise them up over your head, you're going to meet um, some resistance on the arm that has the thumb down. And that's because we're closing that space in the front where all of those um, things run through to help our shoulder move. Um, so anytime we're moving our arm on a neurologic arm, we want to move it in the thumbs up position to open up that space so that we're not pinching those um, muscles and tendons and nerves and things that are in that space right there. Um, another thing that can happen to your shoulder is called bicep tendonitis from this subluxation. So our biceps are what help us bend our elbow. They're right here on the front of your upper arm and they attach, those muscles attach up here at your shoulder, right where that subluxation is occurring. Um, and that tendonitis just means a swelling or a, like an inflammation of your tendons. So basically your bicep tendon just gets irritated right up here. And when we move our arm above 90 degrees, so if this is 90 degrees, when we take it up in this space and we have a subluxation, we're putting ourselves at risk for bicep tendonitis because we're stretching that shoulder and those um, ligaments and tendons past where they want to be. So you want to be careful if you've got that neurologic arm, that neurologic shoulder, never to take your arm up in this 90 above 90 degree area unless you're with your therapist and they, there are things we can do to position the shoulder properly so that those things aren't happening. You're not getting that impingement. You're not getting that tendonitis. But when you're alone at home, you want to be careful not to take your arm above 90 degrees because of those things. Um, another common syndrome of a neurologic arm or arms, excuse me, is central pain syndrome. I think the statistic now is something like 70% of people post stroke or post spinal cord injury are going to have some sort of chronic shoulder pain or shoulder injury. Um, and that is because, you know, our musculature is not holding us where we're supposed to be and we don't have the sensation to protect the arm as much. Maybe you have a little bit of inattention to those arms or that side. Um, so we're just at risk already. And our brain, after it undergoes an injury like a stroke or a brain injury, um, doesn't perceive pain the same way that it used to. Um, so even the lightest touch can be painful. And this isn't for everyone who has had a stroke. This is only for, again, you know, where it's happened in your brain. And if you've developed something called central pain syndrome. But central pain syndrome can be very um, invasive in people's lives because, you know, just setting their arm from the armrest in their lap can be incredibly painful. Um, so we need to be careful not to worsen things like that. So things like positioning, um, you wanna be positioned um, at night in your bed correctly, and we'll go over um, proper positioning a little bit later. Um, and things like needle sticks in the arm, you don't wanna add any extra trauma to the arm if you have central pain syndrome. And you want to just be careful in general, like during transfers, if you're needing assistance with transfers, you want to always get your arms in a safe place in front of you in your lap where they're not going to get caught on your wheelchair or an armrest um, or get stuck somewhere because your body is healing after an injury like this, right? And any extra injury you add on top of that is only going to set you back. So we want to be always protecting our arms and our, especially our shoulders and our upper extremities um, after these injuries. Another thing that can happen um, in a neurologic arm is called a contracture. And a contracture happens when we're not moving our joints. So our upper extremity, our arm has your shoulder, your elbow, your wrist, and your fingers. Those are the joints. Those are all the things that can move um, in our upper body. And if we aren't moving those, you can develop something called this contraction. And contracture just means that your tendons and your muscles have gotten tight, so you can't move them. And prolonged periods of this um, contracture of the muscles can lead to contracture of the bone. And when you get a bone contracture, you're stuck like that. There's no going back. 
Um, so we want to be careful and um, preserve that range of motion in our arm and with light stretching every day, not to the point of hurting yourself, um, not to the point where you know you're about to rip your muscle or your tendon, but light passive range of motion to avoid contracture um, is going to be really important as well as positioning. Um, and like I said, we're going to talk more about positioning. One more announcement. <laughs> We're gonna switch gears again here and talk about the principles of neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity is this um, idea that our brains are plastic and they are subject to change. So we're all changing every day. If you think about, you know, who you were when you were first born, you were a baby, you had to learn to walk and talk and do all the things that you can do now. You did that because your brain is plastic and it can change and it can grow. On the flip side of our brain being able to change and grow, it can also digress and we can lose portions of it if we don't use them. So um, in the rehab world or in the neuro rehab world, we have these 10 principles of neuroplasticity and every neurotherapist is keeping these in the back of their mind. Um, when it comes to your therapy. There are a few that I have highlighted in red that are super um, important to therapists, especially in that first six months to a year range after someone's initial injury that we're going to really hone in on, but all of them are important. The first two, use it or lose it, or use it and improve it, go back to that just basic idea that our brains are plastic. So. If we are not using our arm and we're doing nothing about it and we're not um, providing therapy to the arm, then we are going to lose it. Um, on the flip side of that, if we are using it, we can get better and we can improve the range of motion and the strength and the coordination that our arm has. Um, the third principle of neuroplasticity is specificity. So we're we're looking at your deficits always and specifically where are your deficits so maybe you have great shoulder range of motion and strength but your fingers you just cannot coordinate them to pick up your spoon or to sign your name so for that we're not going to work on shoulder strengthening all day because that doesn't make sense the deficit is more in your fingers and your hands so being specific um about the activities that we give you um is what's going to help your um your brain change and improve. I, when I was a student, um, my clinical instructor always just said, treat the deficits. You know, you know, you don't have to have big fancy words for everything as long as you're identifying where people are having trouble and that's what you're giving. Those are the tasks you're giving them to work on. Then that's specificity. Um, salience and transfer. Um, salience means you have to be bought into why we're doing this, right? Like you have to find some value or else you're not going to care. Um, transference means um, activities are generalizable. So when we're making you play with the little pegs or having you do um, strengthening activities and you're looking at us saying, you know, I'm never doing this in my daily life. We're thinking, right, but if I handed you a tube of toothpaste and told you to open it and close it 50 times, you'd look at it like we're even crazier. So they're generalizable. If we're working on this skill, then that will transfer to the functional task that you're working on that you would like to get back to doing. Um, interference, also important. You don't want to have poor relearning. Really, this applies to um, injury. You know, you there's compensatory movements um, that we can do with our shoulders and our arms um, that aren't exactly healthy. So if I'm missing certain muscles in my arm and I'm using other muscles to compensate for them, um, that can interfere with our brain's learning. So you want to be safe and only do um, what your arm is capable of. Um, time, uh, there are windows of time where you're make, you'll make more progress than others. Um, there is no end date. I get a lot of patients asking me, you know, how long am I going to keep improving? And our, like I said, our brains are always going to be plastic. We're always changing. Um, so there's not like a day, you know, one year, and that's when your, your time is up for um, improving. That's not true. However, the closer you are to injury, the more... Um, the more chance you have of making more progress. Like it kind of um, is like a, a wave or like a graph in that um, within a year or within you know the first six months you have more opportunity for progress, but that does not mean that progress ever stops. 
Um, our, our brains are more plastic at a younger age. Uh, you know, this is a principle of neuroplasticity, but I don't love it. I still make my older patients do the same thing I'm making my younger patients do because we are all capable of making um, plastic change in our brains. And then those last two are super important, repetition and intensity. Our brain needs hundreds of thousands of repetitions to make a change. Um, the upper extremity literature or the research in occupational therapy says that we need up to six, more than 600 repetitions a day, daily. We need to be moving our arm, whether it's passively active assist or active range of motion over 600 times a day to be making good, valuable change in our brain. And for the lower extremities, it's something like a thousand. We wanna be taking up to a thousand steps a day to regain um, our legs. Um, and the other part of that is intensity. These things have to be challenging. You have to get your heart rate up. Your whole body has to be involved. So if you've ever been in therapy and you're looking at your therapist like they've got six heads because we're asking you to get your heart rate up and you haven't done that in quite some time, there is a reason for it, I promise. This is all research and evidence-based um, principles that are going to help you change your brain and get your body back. Um, so how to regain my arm and my hand. Um, you need to meet your arms where they are. You know, if you are flaccid and you have no musculature going on, that's okay. There's different ways to incorporate your hands into your daily life. Or maybe you've got good strength and you're really just working on coordination and doing more like fine motor tasks. Then challenge yourself with that. Um, but the biggest thing, the first step is we need to protect it. Um, First step is positioning. When we are sitting up in our chairs during the day and you have a weak arm or a spastic arm, you need to make sure it's positioned properly. So supported with an armrest or an arm trough so that your um, shoulder isn't hanging low and gravity isn't working on that subluxation of your shoulder. You wanna support yourself at the elbow. We also want to make sure that we're stretching and having an extended position with our wrists and our hands. If we get stuck like this all day, um, this is how we're going to stay. You know, you go to therapy for an hour and we stretch you and move you and then you go sit or go home or do whatever you do for the rest of the day. And you're like this. This is how we're going to stay. So our positioning is really important um, to keeping our joints and our range of motion preserved. Um, we need to be careful with our arms during transfers, like I said before, um, putting them in front of you where you can see them in your eyesight. Um, you never want to pull on your arms and your shoulders. Even people without injuries, neurological injuries, you really never want to be pulling on somebody's shoulder. Our shoulders are very sensitive and prone to injury. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about positioning. Um, so I told you about you know, sitting up in a chair, but at nighttime, you don't want to lay on a shoulder that has a subluxation. So if you're a side sleeper, try to sleep on the other side, the unaffected side, and build up pillows under that arm that's weaker to support it so it's not pulling across your body all night. Um, and if you're a back sleeper, which is what we would prefer usually, get pillows um, that support your arms on top and get that extended position with your fingers straight and your wrists flat. Um, another way to regain your arm is you have to pay attention to it. It goes back to that use it or lose it principle. If I am if I have inattention and I'm just not paying attention to my arm all day, it's not going to come back. You need to look at it, notice it, notice what it feels like. Does it feel like nothing? Okay, where can we go from there? <laughs> you want to really pay attention to your arms when they're weak. And then the other way is just to use it, include your arms in your daily tasks. Now that's going to look different, right? Because we used to have the normal strength we're used to, and now our arm is weaker and we don't have the same range of motion or coordination or sensation, but we have to find ways to still incorporate our arms into our day with what we have which is what we're going to kind of talk about next is meeting our arms where they are. So if you have a mild impairment or, um, oh, sorry, I got ahead of myself. We'll talk about positioning a little bit more and then we'll get back into how to incorporate your arm into your days. So another part of positioning is splinting or orthotics. Um, splints are great to help keep your fingers and your wrists in proper position during the day and at nighttime. 
A lot of times if you start to get that tightness in your fingers and they're curling up and staying that way and you can't quite stretch them out yet, we'll recommend that you purchase the resting hand splint and that's that top one um, to the right of the screen. It's um, just going to keep your hand and your wrist in a nice open position and protect your hand at nighttime. Another thing we sometimes can recommend is a wrist cock up splint. So if you have um, a weak wrist and it's sitting down like this all day, we have nerves and muscles and tendons that run along the back of our arms, our forearms. And if they're stretched all day like this, and this is how our hand is positioned all day, they can get damaged and too stretched. So having something to support the wrist and keep it in a nice neutral position can be helpful. And then the other orthotic sometimes we'll recommend is a shoulder sublux sling. We don't recommend these to everybody. Um, and I am going to say this at the end, but I'll say it right now. Please don't um, go buying any of these splints or orthotics just because I'm, I said they could help. You want to talk to your doctor or your therapist and see what's right for you. Um, but just so you have some knowledge, the, um, the subluxation sling, Again, is not appropriate for everybody just because you have a sublux, but it can help with pain and comfort and positioning during the day. It's usually a daytime wear thing, and it just helps to keep that shoulder in the right position and the right um, location throughout your day. Um, another option for people, especially with um, starting to develop contracture or that stuck position, you know, you start losing those muscles or tendons, like their, their bendiness, you can get something called a dynamic splint, and that just means that it's spring-loaded. So if you're stuck in like a fist, you can get a dynamic splint that's going to have springs or um, rubber bands that open your hand for you. Or it can be the opposite. Maybe you're stuck in an open position like this and you lost your flexion or your bending of your fingers. You can get ones that are going to help you stretch to get into this position. Um, these dynamic splints are low load, long stretch. So it, it's not pulling on you all day and you don't want to go yanking on your fingers and hurting yourself. It's it's low, low stretch, light pull, but it's over a long period of time, which is what our muscles and our tendons um, respond best to. So now going back, sorry, I thought I had these in a different order. Going back to how to include our arms um, in our everyday tasks. So someone with a mild impairment um, and their arms might do things like button their shirts and turn a key in a lock. You know, I always tell my patients, especially people with a mild impairment who are getting some good strength and range of motion back, even if you're right-handed and the injury is on your left side, try to use your left hand to do things because the more we force our brain to think about that part of our body that's been injured neurologically, the more it's going to start to use it and get stronger and more coordinated. So maybe naturally you would have always opened your door or um, fed yourself with your right hand because you're right-handed, but maybe try doing it with your left hand to force your brain to think about um, that side of your body. Um, there are other ways to include um, your arm if you have more of a moderate impairment you can do something like wash a window and you can always do these things with active assistive range of motion. So using your stronger arm to kind of help and support your other arm do tasks it's called bilaterally. So maybe my left arm is the one that's weak and it can't do things by itself, but it can do some things with a little assistance from the other arm. That's a, a good way to get your arm included in your daily tasks is use both hands and try to make your um, weaker side the dominant hand and your, your uh, stronger side is just going to give it a little bit of assist. And some more ideas for someone with a more severe impairment. So maybe you're flaccid, maybe you left rehab and you still are not getting much strength back. There are still ways that you can include your arm and still continue to make benefit or, um, gains after you leave therapy. And that's things like just including it in your daily tasks. Maybe you take your arm and you set it on your remote and it stabilizes the remote while you push the buttons with the other hand. Or maybe when you're going to put um, toothpaste on your toothbrush, you take the weaker arm and you set it on your toothbrush and then use it as a stabilizer. Maybe you can hold a book on the table. Um, there, there's lots of different things. I We have a um, 
a woman in the community who helps out around a lot here um, who had a stroke herself who likes to tell a story about how she didn't have much movement in her hand yet but she was trying to include it in her daily tasks to try to get it back and she would just take her hand and set it on her cat <laughs> and she wouldn't be able to move her hand but she could you know feel what the fur felt like and try to assist the hand in petting the cat that so it's getting creative like that. And how can I get my arm included in my daily tasks with whatever amount of function I have? Bottom line, please, please, please consult your doctor or your therapist before trying anything that I've just told you. Um, please don't go buying anything before. It, it might not be appropriate for you. You always want to consult a therapist or a doctor before um, trying any of these interventions or treatment ideas or recommendations. Um, and, you know, other bottom line is just preserve your range of motion. You can always safely do passive range of motion with yourself or have um, a family member or caregiver gently range your arm. Um, you never want to pull on it. You never want to push it past its limits. You never want to hurt yourself or push yourself to the point of pain. But gently moving your fingers throughout the day, gently bending and straightening your elbow um, is gonna is gonna help preserve that range of motion in your joints and keep those joints healthy for you.